This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You will be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. The temples of Abu Sembel were built in the 13th century BCE by Pharaoh Ramses II and are situated on the western shore of Lake Nasser, some 230 kilometers southwest of Aswan. These were dedicated to the deified Ramses II as well as the gods Amon, Rahrakte, and Ptah, and were carved out of solid rock. The smaller temple was devoted to the pharaoh's wife Nefertari and the goddess Hathor, and the larger temple was dedicated to the monarch and the gods. Until the early 19th century, when Swiss explorer Johann Ludwig Burckhardt discovered the temples, they were mostly unknown to the rest of the globe. The temples, however, received worldwide recognition in the 1960s when they were moved as a result of the Aswan High Dam project, which threatened their survival by raising Lake Nasser's waters. In order to preserve the temples for future generations, the World Society, under the direction of UNESCO, organized a huge technical operation to disassemble and reconstruct them at a higher height. The Great Temple's Front which has four enormous sitting sculptures of Ramses II that are each over 20 meters tall, is one of Abu Simbel's most outstanding features. These sculptures, which depict the pharaoh's divine position in ancient Egyptian culture, are flanked by smaller statues of his wife, children, and other gods. A number of rooms and sanctuaries that make up the great temple are adorned with elaborate sculptures and bas-reliefs that show events from the pharaoh's military successes and his status as a heavenly ruler. The most well-known of them was the Battle of Kadesh, when Ramses II defeated the Hittites with ease. The innermost sanctuary of the temple is where sculptures of the gods and Ramses II, who was deified, are located. The smaller Nefertari and Hathor temple is similarly impressive with six enormous standing sculptures of Ramses II and his queen, two of whom are Nefertari at its entrance. The royal pair are seen presenting sacrifices to the gods and celebrating their celestial marriage on the interior walls. The temples of Abu Simbel functioned as a representation of Egypt's might and domination in the area. It was also a tribute to Ramses II's ability as a warrior and king, a tribute that was well deserved. The temples were strategically placed along the Nile River so that everyone passing through Nubia would be able to see them, acting as a continual reminder of Egypt's might. Moreover, the temples were essential to ancient Egyptians' religious practices. The orientation of the Great Temple was planned such that on February 22nd and October 22nd of each year, the sun's rays would enter the inner sanctuary and enlighten the statues of the gods and the deified Ramses II, emphasizing the pharaoh's divine character. The perception of the divine was the secret ingredient of the rulers. The temples of Abu Simbel are a surviving representation of the architectural brilliance, power, and cultural might of ancient Egypt. One of many, that is. We can't forget the numerous other monuments that prove beyond any reasonable doubt that the influence of ancient Egyptians will echo forever. What is the primary purpose of the temples?
Why were the temples relocated in the 1960s? What can be inferred, when the professor says, tribute that was well deserved? What is the meaning behind this statement? The perception of the divine was the secret ingredient of the rulers. What is the significance, of the dates, February 22nd and October 22nd, at the temples? What is the professor's opinion, about the numerous monuments, of ancient Egypt? Now listen to the conversation between two people. How are you this afternoon, and how can I be of service to you? Hello, I'm sorry to bother you, but I have to return these books. Okay, it seems that you are returning two out of three of the books that were checked out to you. Could you tell me where the third book is located? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I must have left it at home. As soon as I locate it, I'll give it back to you. Since you did not return all of the books, there will be a charge placed on your account. That is how our policy works. Is there any way you could get me off the hook this time? That was nothing more than an oversight. I am aware that it was done inadvertently, but I am sorry to say that I am unable to dismiss the fine. We are required to act in accordance with a predetermined set of guidelines. I'd want to avoid having to pay the fine if there's any other way possible. Regrettably, no. The violation must be corrected. But if you return the book within a reasonable amount of time, the fee will be lowered to an acceptable level. Well, I understand, and I'll be sure to give it back as soon as I can. Great. The amount of the fee will continue to rise if you continue to postpone the return. In addition, please do not hesitate to contact us if you have any questions about the policies that we have in place. I'm appreciative of you letting me know. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Pardon me, I have one more question. Do you allow renewals on the books that you lend out? You can, in fact, get another year out of your books. Nevertheless, 
This is contingent on there being space available, and you will only be able to renew them if no one else has put a hold on them. Students shouldn't hoard books unnecessarily. Okay, so how do I go about renewing them? Either by going online or by going to the library, you may renew them. Just inform us, and we will take care of renewing them for you. But be careful with the other books you take from us. Thanks. What is the maximum amount of time I may retain them once I've renewed them? You are welcome to retain them for the same loan duration as previously, but you are permitted to renew them a maximum of two times. Got it. Many thanks for your assistance. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy your day. What is the conversation mainly about? Is it possible to waive off the fine? Why does the librarian say? Students shouldn't hoard books unnecessarily. Why does the librarian say to the student, to be careful? Now listen to the lecture. During the lecture that we have today, we are going to go further into the world of LED lighting and investigate the many advantages and uses of this kind of lighting. The technology behind LED lighting has advanced dramatically over the last several years and has emerged as a popular alternative to more conventional approaches to lighting. LED lighting is known for its superior energy efficiency, which is one of its key benefits. LEDs are a more cost-effective and environmentally friendly alternative to traditional lighting systems because of their superior energy efficiency. For instance, an incandescent bulb that uses 60 watts of power may be swapped out with an LED bulb that uses just 10 watts of power but still emits the same amount of light. This switch results in a significant reduction in energy use. The longevity of LED lighting is another important advantage of this kind of lighting, completely game-changing. 
LED lights have a lifespan of up to 50,000 hours, making them far more durable than conventional light bulbs. Because of this, LED lights need to be replaced less often, which results in less trash being produced and fewer expenses associated with maintenance. Moreover, LED lights have a great degree of versatility and may be used in a broad variety of contexts and settings. Since they come in a wide range of hues and intensities, they are well suited for use as lighting for ornamental purposes or for the purpose of producing a particular atmosphere. Since they are very directed and may be aimed to emphasize certain regions or objects, LED lights are becoming an increasingly popular option for accent lighting applications. Horticulture is one of the most niche uses for LED lighting, which is also employed in other specialized areas. LEDs are increasingly being used in the field of horticulture as a means of producing light at a range of wavelengths that are beneficial to the growth and development of plants. The use of LED lights in the field of horticulture has been shown to be very successful due to the fact that these lights consume very little energy and provide the ideal lighting conditions for the development of plants. Artificial light simulates reality. LED lighting is being more widely used in automobiles, which has contributed to its rise in popularity. The LED lights are used in a variety of applications, including headlights, taillights, and others. LEDs are extremely directed, which is a trait that is very necessary for headlights. Moreover, LEDs waste less energy than conventional lighting techniques, which makes them perfect for use in electric cars. LED lights are also employed for the illumination of streets and sidewalks. Conventional street lights need a substantial amount of energy to operate and are a potential source of significant carbon emissions. LED street lights are more environmentally friendly and use less energy than traditional street lights. This helps lessen the overall effect that street lighting has on the environment. In addition, LED streetlights are very directional and can be pointed in any direction, which helps to reduce light pollution and improve visibility. Light pollution is a big issue since it hides the wonders of the night sky from us, wonders that we have a right to see. What is one of the primary advantages of LED lighting that was discussed in the lecture? What is a significant benefit of using LED lights for decorative lighting? What is a specialized application of LED lighting? Why does the professor say, artificial light simulates reality?
Why are LED lights ideal for electric vehicles? Why does the professor say this? Wonders that we have a right to see. Now listen to the conversation between two people. How are you, Professor Smith? I was wondering if there was any way to get extra credit for this class. I'd like to improve my overall grade. Yes, I can give you a chance to earn more points for the next homework assignment. Instead of writing 200 words, write a 400-word response. I'll give you more points if you do that. That's a great idea. I'll take on that challenge for sure. Professor, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Is there anything else about the course you'd like to discuss? Actually, yes. I'm worried that I won't be able to keep up with the readings. I'm having a hard time managing it. To solve this problem, you should put quality ahead of quantity. That makes sense. The second thing that worries me is taking part in class discussions. I find it to be hard. Bring a few points or questions to class discussions so you can take more part. Don't forget that the point is to learn from each other, not to know everything. Thank you for the great advice. My third concern is about how to put my essays together. I don't know how to do it in the best way. Think of your essay's thesis statement as a lighthouse that helps your readers find their way through your writing. Make sure it's clear and strong, and make sure your ideas flow in a way that makes sense. Professor, thank you so much. I'll try to use these tips. I'm sure that if you work hard and practice, you'll get better at these things. Don't forget that I'm here to help you if you need advice or if you have more questions. Professor, I appreciate your help. I'll keep your advice in mind and reach out if I need any assistance. That's the way to do it. I look forward to seeing your progress throughout the semester. Good luck. And feel free to stop by during my office hours if you ever need help. What is the main purpose of the conversation between the student and the professor? What does the professor offer the student as an opportunity for extra credit? What does the professor mean when he advises the student to put quality ahead of quantity regarding readings?
What advice does the professor give to help the student participate more in class discussions? What does the professor really mean, when he says the thesis statement, should be like a lighthouse, that guides your readers? Now listen to the lecture. Today we'll go into the intriguing world of over 47 species of leafcutter ants, which are predominantly found in the tropical rainforests of Central and South America. These amazing beings live in a caste system restricted society that exhibits outstanding cooperation and labor sharing. They are distinguished from other ant species by their amazing capacity to grow fungal gardens, which is a feature that sets them apart from other ant species. We must first talk about the intricate societal structure of leafcutter ants in order to comprehend their significance. Leafcutter ants have a caste system that is separated into workers, soldiers and reproductive individuals just like many other ant species. Depending on their size, workers are further divided into many subcasts, each of which is in charge of carrying out certain tasks. They can be quite productive in their everyday tasks thanks to this arrangement, which also helps the colony as a whole. I am particularly intrigued by the leaf cutter ant society's practice of fungus gardening. Leaf cutter ants, as their name suggests, harvest leaves from plants and bring them back to their nests. Contrary to what many people think, they don't consume these leaves. Instead, they use the plant matter to feed a grown fungus that becomes their main source of nourishment. This symbiotic interaction is a prime example of mutualism in nature and has evolved over millions of years. It is interesting that this reciprocal connection is deeper still. The ants' bodies contain a particular bacterium that produces antibiotic chemicals that help ward against dangerous mold and germs. For the purpose of defending the ants' fungal gardens, chemical warfare is necessary. Several researchers have even compared the use of antibiotics by ants to current agricultural methods. Leafcutter ants are devoted protectors of their home range. Due to their size and strength, soldier ants are in charge of repelling any dangers. They have strong mandibles that can pierce flesh, which has attracted the attention of researchers who are interested in exploring the possibility of using them in surgical procedures. One cannot help but be in awe at the adaptability and dexterity of these organisms in varied contexts, despite the fact that it is not a common habit. Finally, let's think about how leafcutter ants affect the environment. They are occasionally viewed as pests because they defoliate plants, which can result in lower crop yields. Nonetheless, by assisting in the process of decomposition and recycling nutrients back into the soil, these ants perform a crucial part 
in preserving the equilibrium of their ecosystem. They may impair agriculture in some way, but their total benefit to the ecosystem outweighs any potential drawbacks. Finally, the leaf cutter ants give us an enthralling glimpse into the complexity and inventiveness of insect life. These ants have complex social systems and inventive farming methods which teach us important lessons about collaboration, flexibility, and resiliency. Which aspect of leaf cutter ants is the most emphasized in the lecture? When the professor expresses admiration, what specific aspect of leaf cutter ants does he highlight? Regarding the potential use of leaf cutter ants mandibles in surgical procedures, which statement best reflects the professor's stance? What does the professor imply about the pest status of leaf cutter ants in the context of their ecological role? What can be inferred when the professor is discussing the relationship between leaf cutter ants and the bacterium found on their bodies? In the conclusion of the lecture, what does the professor primarily emphasize about leafcutter ants?